All right, so first of all, 10 minutes is tough. Where is Matt? From the White House? No, the other Matt. Yeah, there you are. You watched him. It's hard to do. Uh, and the second thing is short break. So I know people are filtering back in, but now I have 9.58. I did, before I was the deputy program manager uh, for Gateway, work in human spaceflight operations for 20 years. Um, so actually, it's been interesting to listen to all of you, because uh, I'm probably the furthest away from policy you could possibly get in terms of my background, right? I sat on console and mission control when uh, the very first Dragon docked to the space station. I sat on console and mission control when Bob and Doug launched on the first SpaceX crew vehicle, things like that. So most of my experience is uh, human space flight operations. And before I came to Gateway, I was the chief flight director for about five years. So I've been doing Gateway for the last year, um, sort of stepping backwards in the life cycle from the execution part to sort of the design and development part. You know, listening to the talks where I think of most of you is at the, the very sort of front end and the, and the policy piece, right? So a little bit we're going to start there from a NASA standpoint. Let's see if I can get my chart to work. Is it working? Let's try it again. All right, there we go. So moon to Mars, right? One of the great things about listening to everything today is, is there's repeatability in the discussions, which I think is what you want in the industry, right? So human spaceflight, there's an amazing amount going on, as well as just spaceflight in general, as is evidenced by all of you being here. And much of that discussion is around getting to the moon, and then going to Mars, right? So when you talk about the White House and OSTP and the Cislunar and what they have put out in terms of tenets and objectives, NASA takes that sort of down a notch and says our architectural concept review. So Space Symposium uh, last April, our deputy administrator, Pam Melroy, rolled out our ACR, right? So we gotta learn acronyms, ac uh, architectural concept review. With it actually came six white papers. Um, one of them was about gateway, so on the NASA website, I encourage you to read it. And the other one was about the orbit we are going to be in, the near rectilinear halo orbit. And so that's kind of how it flows together, right? If you like timelines, you can kind of think about it from a timeline. If you like building blocks, well, that's the foundational building block of what we're trying to do moon to Mars. All right, so the challenge is you take all of these ideas and you have to execute them and turn them into practical things. You have to go build hardware. You have to get it on orbit, which many of you know is very, very difficult, right? Cost money, cost time. You run into lots of challenges. And so the good news for NASA is that last November, we flew the very first Artemis mission. Um, so Artemis is interesting, right? It's the name of a mission, Artemis One, And we actually also think about it kind of as an umbrella, which is a collection of different functions, right? You need a rocket. You need a vehicle that carries the crew, human rated, certified. Uh, you're going to need a gateway, which we're going to talk about more in a minute. So space station around the moon. You are going to need a lander to get down to the surface. And then, of course, all of the surface operations. So when we talk about Artemis, we think about that entire architecture. So last November, uh, we actually got to the execution phase of the very first mission. No crew yet, right? So when we're up here talking about Mars and we're at, you know, almost step one, at least in our lifetime, of getting to the moon, it can seem a little daunting. I would tell you from my perspective, it's actually really exciting because we got over the first hurdle, right? When you talk to many of uh, the, the team members that did Apollo, the flight directors, the astronauts, the designers, they talk about, you know, getting that first step is always the hardest. And I'd say maybe getting the first two steps is the hardest because this one didn't have crew on it, right? So Artemis II, the next mission, is when we'll put our crew on the vehicle and send them around the moon and back. No landing yet, but we'll send them around the moon and back. So we named the crew. Um, they are wonderful people. One of them is actually a Canadian astronaut, and so it's mentioned in a couple of the panels trying to do this as a, as a global team, right? The Artemis Accords have been mentioned, again, trying to do it as a global team. And the next panel is going to talk a little bit about the Artemis Accords. So uh, the picture on the left, let's see, yep, your left, is SLS rocket. In the middle is an actual real photo of the Orion spacecraft. So that's the one that carries the crew and then splashed down. So went around the moon and back. Uh, next year, if everything goes correctly, we will do uh, that same thing again with our crew, followed uh, the following year by Artemis III, which is the first moon landing mission. So we haven't quite gotten to the gateway yet, so Artemis I, Artemis II, Artemis III, and then Artemis IV, 
uh, which is scheduled now in the 2027 timeframe, is where Gateway will start to get added to the architecture. So now we're going to talk about Gateway for just a few minutes. All right, so Matt set uh, me up really well earlier when he talked about cislunar space. And so this is a small animation of our near rectilinear halo orbit in cislunar space. So it's at one of the Lagrange points, right? Stable point between the Earth and the Moon and the spacecraft specifically chosen because of the performance of the spacecraft, right? You don't need as much power or as much propulsion to get in or out of that orbit or to stay in that orbit, right? When you're orbiting around, you have to do things called orbital maintenance maneuvers to kind of stay in the right position. And so this is a stable place where it doesn't cost you a lot of fuel to do that, right? Um, we also have access to many places on the surface of the moon from this orbit. Six and a half days revolution, and we get relatively close, as you can tell, it kind of looks like a big egg or a big ellipse. So on one side, we get pretty close uh, to the surface of the moon, and that gives us the opportunity, again, from a fuel standpoint, to, you know, the lander can leave Gateway, drop us off, and come back. Why is all of that important in the context of sustainability? I mentioned the white paper earlier. There were a tremendous number of studies to try to figure out which orbit to put Gateway in. This one was specifically chosen for all of those reasons. Gateway has a 15-year lifetime. And so sustainability, right, ability to be maintained at a certain level. We need Gateway to work and function and be safe for humans for 15 years or even longer. If you're familiar with the International Space Station, uh, it originally started with a much shorter lifetime and now we're extended out to 2030. And so we want to be able to not only just continue, but also maintain it safely for a crew for very long. So that's why this orbit was very specifically chosen. Let's see, Gateway itself, you can't invite an engineer and not have an exploded view chart. So just thank you guys very much for humoring me. Um, back to sustainability, right? A couple of the panels have mentioned the geopolitics. They are incredibly important. Gateway is an international space station with significant contributions from international partners, Canadian Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency, European Space Agency. They are all contributing entire modules, a robotic arm, ECLAS systems, batteries. These things are, are incredible pieces of Gateway. The first two elements, actually, of Gateway that will launch here and be on orbit in about the 2026 timeframe are, are US-based. One of them is HALO, Northrop Grumman. One of them is a power propulsion element and Maxar. But beyond that, their international contributions, the next module I have, International Habitation Module, very, very fancy acronym there, um, is, is ESA. ESA is responsible for building that entire module for the Gateway Space Station. So from a geopolitical standpoint, this is an amazing opportunity to continue what we've built in low Earth orbit with the International Space Station. And from our standpoint, and this was said earlier at NASA, this is really the way to do this, right? No one company, no one country can go it alone. It's a big ecosystem. It costs a lot of money to get this done and a lot of uh, determination and backing. And so the international aspect of Gateway is tremendously important. Um, one of the other things that we have started really to think about that's important as we try to encourage others to participate, both commercial companies and countries, is the interoperability, right? This has been mentioned a couple times as well. Extremely important. You want everyone to have enough opportunity to innovate, but make sure everything goes together at the end, right? You can build a spacecraft and then you can't actually fly it if it doesn't talk to each other, right? Power systems, life support systems, communication systems, the data. And when you think about data, you're talking down to the individual, you know, ones and zeros in a string of numbers, and then those two elements can't talk to each other. And so interoperability is really challenging because you don't want to be too prescriptive and stifle innovation, but you want everything to work together in the end. And so as you think about bringing in policy and bringing in new elements, we've got to find the balance there, right? There's not an answer, we just have to really be mindful of it. The other piece in terms of the sphere of orbit and the sphere of the surface, right, is supply chain and logistics. If we are gonna be sustainable, 
if we're going to go to the moon to stay. Those are the two big spheres. The on-orbit piece actually helps us more getting to Mars in terms of living and working far away from the Earth. The low Earth orbit space station, International Space Station, today you can get home in eh, six hours on average, maybe four if it's a good day. You can't get home from the moon like that, right? And so we've got to have autonomy. The crew members have to have the capabilities they need to take care of themselves. And so the on-orbit piece, taking what we learned from the International Space Station to Gateway and then on to Mars is incredibly important for sustainability. And with that goes logistics and resupply. So the surface, right, you can build things, you can put them on the surface, and then they run out of fuel and you can't use them anymore. We spent a whole lot of money to get it there, so you gotta figure out how you're gonna resupply it. Gateway's the same way, right? It's not built to hold and house food and water and things that the crews need. You gotta bring it with you. So we have to have a logistics chain and actually a logistics vehicle to Gateway in order to make it sustainable. Uh, we actually have contract out those are commercial vehicles and opportunities to participate in Gateway on the Artemis program. Some of them are internationals as well. So supply chain, logistics, interoperability, a couple of things that people talked about, things like dust and trash and orbital debris. If you're gonna live and work in your NRHO orbit and your Gateway space station for the next 15 plus years, we have to figure out how to do all of those things. So Gateway's sort of the tip of the spear where we're actually out trying to tactically solve those problems, right? So we have a model as an example that tries to explain how the dust is going to come off the surface with the lander and then impact Gateway. Does it land on your solar rays? Do they degrade? Then do you need to build an extra solar array because you're gonna have to replace it in fewer than 15 years. What about your mechanisms and your joints inside of your robotic arm? Do you need to protect them? Now, those are all traits, right? They cost money versus risk, and so that's kind of what we do every day as we build up Gateway. So Gateway itself, right, back to the exploded view, doesn't happen all at once. I mentioned power propulsion element, big thing with solar rays, that's Maxar, and then uh, the uh, module right next to it is Halo. They go up together about uh, 2026, it takes 11 months to spiral out through the Van Allen belts. They have an electric propulsion system, talk about sustainable, and another reason that the NRHO orbit was chosen, because it's a place where you can use electric propulsion because you don't need a lot in order to maintain your orbit. And then we'll add, over the next series of Artemis missions, our IHAB, which we talked about, um, a refueling module. Again, sustainability, I heard refueling talked about a little bit earlier today and an airlock so that we have the ability to maintain the gateway, go outside, change out boxes, right? That's an interesting question, and I'm, my time is zero, so I will finish up kind of right here. Um, but if you think about it, gateway is an outpost. It's not a 100% human-tended space station like our low Earth orbit space station. So there's gonna be significant periods of time where there is no crew there. And so now you're transitioning into autonomy and robotically being able to replace things like pumps or batteries. And so all of that heads towards sustainability for Mars and the future of not only human spaceflight, but spaceflight in general. The panel before talked about why is this important? You know, what is, what's in it for us on Earth, right? And so even our international habitation module, there are, you know, 30 European countries contributing everything from you know small tiny chips to batteries to integration and all of those countries and all of the companies are learning how to do that technology not just for space but also for themselves here on earth and so from a technology test bed we're really excited to kind of have a global presence both from a country and a company standpoint. Um, the next chart really is just a picture to kind of get off the stage. Um, remind everyone that uh, Artemis Gateway uh, is going to be an amazing opportunity for us to live and work in cislunar space. We think of it as deep space when you grew up flying low Earth orbit vehicles, right? And mostly that's crew based because you can't get them home very quick. And so um, I appreciate you guys having me today and I'll be around uh, in case you have a few questions because 10 minutes was, uh, was not, uh, not a long time to scratch the surface, but I think I did okay. So thank you guys.